Welcome to the sixth class of this Deep Learning Fall 2022 edition. Uh, 5 p.m. almost, live New York City. Thank you for joining, tuning in today as well for a very dense two hour lesson. And tomorrow we have the third one about new content that has no one has seen it before. So it should be correct. I mean, I show it to a few uh, students of mine today, but they, they said it was okay, a little bit heavy. So that's why I wrote the announcement, right? Don't get too scared. We'll try to get together. Why are we? We are the first to see. Basically, yes. Uh, for my followers, yeah. Uh, two students have seen this before just to, for practice. Anyway, the point is that it might be a little bit harder than usual. So I will try to go as slow as I can, but you have to help me out figuring out what are the hardest part. Still, we should be able to do it. Okay. So just trust in yourself, be hungry, intellectually speaking, and let's give it, give it a shot. Okay. Before that, we're going to be having some small announcements. Uh, no slides share. No, no slides with me and, 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 and lectures come afterwards, right? Because I want you to pay attention to the, you know, like how I do, uh, Young calls it striptease of the slide, like elements happen one after the other. If you already have the slides, then I cannot uh, withhold information from you, temporarily speaking, right? And so I can't play language modeling with you, right? So if you don't see the future, then I can query you and your mind in order to give me a prediction before you see the ground truth. And that's how, you, how I teach, right? So you, you, I can't give you the content before the class because otherwise I cannot teach. So we go always here and there are two things. I think they are nice. Okay. This is from a colleague of mine from, uh, Sapienza, the university in Rome. Uh, he has made a amazing work. I, I really have to say that he explained how auto differentiation works, right? So gather around Twitter folks. It's time for our beloved Alice adventures in a differentiable world. Our magical tour of auto diff and back propagation. I think it's just amazing, right? And then you can go through this uh, post and I think it's just wonderful. I, I believe crazy people are here to make our life more interesting. Okay. So Simone, Simone is just amazing. Okay. The other announcement is about this book here. Uh, it's a paid book, so you don't have to buy. You can always, you know, find it. Let's say this way, but I, I shouldn't be saying these things. I, I this is recorded. Uh, so the, the point over overall here is the the book from uh, Daniel Godoy uh, has very nice diagrams, which is something I really support. Uh, which explain in a similar way I do right with this kind of flow diagrams, these kind of schematics, these kind of circuits, whatever you want to call them. Right. And so I believe at least for me, these are much more intuitive than the mathematics. Mathematics is not always the best abstraction to explain connectivity. Well, it's not the best abstraction to explain connectivity. You have wires to explain connectivity. That's it. All right. So we start. Okay. Let's even start with, um, bonus thing, right? I, I just recap what we have seen last time with me such that we can refresh the ideas and then let's try to progress from where we left off and then let's see how to build on top. Okay. All right. All right. I just, this is the same thing we saw last week. Okay. So it's actually the same. I don't want to, well, the major problem here was the overlapping of the, um, linear decision boundary with what is the warped or tangled manifold. That's the correct word. So how to avoid this overlapping? Well, either you bend those decision boundaries. I don't like it. The perspective, I prefer to un un unwarp, unwarp the, the data. Okay. And that's what I prefer. That's what I show you. Well, this is a stupid animation, but then I show you all those nice uh, drawings and fancy things. And I think I tried to give you some intuition about what we are trying to do. This is the other perspective when you watch the uh, decision boundaries that are linear still from the input of the model, which is the bottom, right? So your linear decision boundary seen from the input get warped basic, basically by the network. So it's exactly the same thing, just two perspectives, right? Uh, then we told so we talk about the data, the pink, the blue, and the orange. This is split in two parts. One side is viewable, the other is not viewable. The one that is viewable are shown with shaded color. It's observed. They have the X, the Y, and the Z. Z and the X are optional, and then you always have the Y. The Y is what we care about, the thing we want to learn. Okay, so the Y is the 
target, the objective. You always have a target. If there is no target, then there is nothing to learn. Okay. So we always think about why the blue ball, why as the target and the thing that we are interested in, regardless whether there are conditions like X or there are unforeseen events, the Z. Okay. Then that was it. I have capital P distinct items. Each of them uh, are going to be size of N here. I say that Y P belongs to the I matrix, the I is the identity matrix, right? So if Y is one of the column of the identity matrix, it's going to be a one hot. And so exactly this. So we have P of these targets of cap capital K uh, elements. Then we saw a neural network inference. We had a pink ball X at the bottom. It goes through the predictor in order to predict what? The hidden representation of my target. Okay. And that's why it's called predictor. We predict the hidden of the target. So if I take the hidden and I decode it, then I get my prediction. Okay. That, that's the just semantics. Predictor predicts the hidden of the target. I get the target, well, approximation of the target by the decoder. The fact that it is an approximation is shown to you by the tilde. That means more or less. Okay. Then we said we would like to have that approximation to be close, right? In, in distance, right? In a, in value to my target. And therefore I put a spring represented by the cost of the spring. Remember, we talk about the, the hook law, the, the energy, you compute the, the integral of the force, right? The, 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 the work. And then you have exactly the MSC. Then we, we had two equation, the hidden layer, the, uh, output prediction. We said F and G are arbitrary nonlinear functions. We said that the prediction is a function of the input, of course, but we'd like to think about as going through this intermediate high dimensional hidden representation. Okay. H stays for hidden. Okay. We don't talk about latent until later, later, later on in the semester. So far, the H stands for hidden or internal representation. These are the two terms that means the same. Latent means something else. We don't care for, for the moment. Okay. So far, no questions. Good. And then there is this, uh, first difference, uh, from, from other, other, other lessons, right? So we introduce here this F. What is F? F is the level of incompatibility between the inputs of my energy system, right? So my energy, uh, model. Energy base model has two inputs right now, X and Y. The F, the scalar value F tells me how incompatible the specific pair is. Okay. This is just definition. How do I compute this level of incompatibility? This level of incompatibility of the two inputs is going to be equal to the cost I pay to produce a prediction that is far from my target. Okay. So C is the cost that you pay for making a prediction far from the target. You basically measure the distance or divergence or whatever you want to call it. That's the C the cost. F is the incompatibility level of the impulse. Okay. And this is just definition, but there are two distinct things. Okay. So far, just recapping, right? So no new content. Then we define this white tilde is this soft dark max. This is a kind of a different thing. People call it other things, but that's incorrect. And I didn't explain what it is, but I just define it as being the exponential of the vector. This S is the linear sum, right? It's the output of the linear summation, the, the, the linear module. So I take the, this linear thing, I exponentiate it and I divide it by the sum of all the exponentials. That's what's written here. Just definition. There is the dot by explaining the definition. Then we say that the loss function, the curly L, tells me how bad a set of weights, W, is for that specific capital weird curly S, which is representing the, for example, training set. Okay. So the loss tells me how bad a parameterization is for a specific set. Okay. And that is given to you by this average one over P sum of to all the P's of this capital L, which is the per sample loss function. Okay. The per sample loss function tells you how bad a specific parameterization is 
for the specific pair of inputs. Okay, so distinction of uh, definitions, but I hope it's clear, right? So one is talking about the whole set, right? You average out all of them. The other one is going to be the like per sample is going to be the how bad the parameters are for that specific pair of samples. Now, the thing that basically simplifies everything in this classification thing, we had that the per sample loss, which is telling me how bad a specific parameterization is for my given pair, we set it to be, right? That arrow with the equal means we set, I, I choose, is a choice, it's not an uh, equality. I chose it to be equal the F, the energy, which is the level of incompatibility of that pair which in turn it's equal to the cost I make from having a prediction that is far from my target. Okay, so there are many steps here, but they're all the same thing, more or less, right? But the, the value is the same. The meaning is completely different, right? I, I hope if you didn't catch it, just listen to me, it's recorded, right? But just make sure you understand each meaning of each symbol, right? They are completely different things. Moving on. Uh, we define, we choose in this case to, to have the C to be the cross entropy or negative log probability, which is going to be the negative log of the inner product between my soft argmax and the one hot. And then we said, blah, 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 this stuff goes to zero if you get it right. This stuff goes to plus infinity if you got it wrong. Does the equality with top arrow means assignment here? Yes, yes. Assignment is not in your homework assignment but in the assignment as I choose, right? So if I choose uh, the loss, a specific loss of being something, right? So I may choose many, many losses. In this case, I, cho I choose something that is called the energy loss. The energy loss, it's basically saying that the loss is equal or is chosen to be equal, is set to F, right? It's like having that uh, arrow with the... the when you write the, the LaTeX, right, you have that, you understand, right? You, you choose. It's not equality. Okay, so how to train this stuff, right? So we have W is going to be the set of all the parameters. And we have this loss, which is how bad the parameterization W is for my set, training set, perhaps. Uh, and we saw this gradient descent, right? We start from initial location, we compute the uh, derivative, right? The, the, where to go and you figure this positive you want to move to the left hand side you move down until you hit the, the the minimum and then we just i just wrote this oh how to compute these partial derivatives oh well you just multiply this bunch of things and this is called chain rule in mathematics so back propagation in uh, uh, deep learning okay but then i didn't explain how it works today i will right that, that's why I will try to again go through this stuff. Before that, let's have a look since it's not very straightforward what this energy uh, is, okay? This free energy. Remember what is the energy right now here? The energy, we decide the energy to be equal to, remember the diagram I showed you like a few minutes ago? My energy F, the level of compatibility of X and Y, we choose now to be equal to how much? the cost function C and the C was defined as the cross entropy, which is equal to this negative log of the inner product. Perfect. Okay, good. All right. So let's have now a view of how this free energy, which is function of the inputs X and Y looks. Okay. I trained a model. I didn't show you the training. I would maybe training we do tomorrow. Uh, so these are my, my, my original points, right? In this case, I have five branches because it looks prettier. You have the whole rainbow instead of just three colors. Uh, I train the model. These are the decision boundaries seen, the, 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 the linear decision boundary of the top, right? Seen from the bottom, like from the input of the model. And this is going to be one energy, okay? So this is one of these cross entropy energy. What do I show you here? So for every location X of the plane, right? I show you what is its energy level, given that I chose the class, first class, number one, okay? So in this case, I chose the class associated to the red branch, right? The red spider. And then I show you how the energy, the free energy changes across the whole uh, 
X domain, right? So X is the, the, the plane, whereas the Y are going to be countable, right? So I have five possible Ys, right? And then for each of these possible options of Y, I have one full R2 plane. Makes sense, right? Because X moves in a plane and the Y is just the discrete. So you have basically a function which is giving you five planes, right? Basically, like you have five planes, one per each class. And so here I show you all these five different uh, choices, okay? So I change the first, second, third class, fourth class, and fifth class, and then I just keep repeating, okay? As you can tell, all points that are in the purple region, right? They all have zero cost. You can see the color uh, on, the, on the side, the color map tells you that they have zero height. What does it mean? What does that mean, right? That means that all those green points have... What does it mean? Tell me. What does the energy tell us? The compatibility, right? And so all those green points are compatible with that specific choice of Y, okay? And so given I pick a Y, now I can see what are the axes that are compatible with that specific peak, cho peak choice of, of, of Y, okay? And so all these points here will also have zero energy, which are very compatible, right? Things are getting more and more, well, less and less compatible as you move away from this area and you get level of incompatibility 21, 25, and whatever, 20, 33, and so on, okay? So this is how this stuff looks, okay? I hope it makes sense. How come some classes are more incompatible with a green? Because they are closer, because the, the compatibility, because this is a smooth function, right? And so this network will try to learn some sort of smooth uh, energy, which is of course going to be depending on the, on the distance, right? Here I show you uh, the first energy, right? The energy associated to the first class is this level of curves, right? And so I, I make it spin such that you can see clearly despite the, the artifact of lines disappearing, okay? And so here again, this is the energy associated to the first class for all the X points. And then in the height, I show you the level of incompatibility of specific axes given one choice of Y. Finally, how do we compute this backpropagation, right? And so now let, let, let's try to go again once more, just make sure we all understand. And I, I also am able to understand how exactly backpropagation works, okay? I mean, I, I think we know, but why not having a, a, another try? All right, so this is the same, uh, almost the same diagram as we saw before. There is a difference in one letter. There is a O on the top left hand side instead of the Y tilde. And also there is no C, capital C, there is a capital D here, right? So there, is, there are two differences uh, from before. I'll tell you in a second what these differences are. So H is exactly the same. I find the summation A input that goes through a nonlinear function. Then let's split the decoder into items. I have this S, um, orange bold S is going to be this linear sum, the output of this affine transformation of the hidden layer. Okay. So I have the hidden, hidden value, hidden layer. I apply an uh, affine transformation, which is written down there. And then I call this my orange bold S for linear sum. Then I get a O, the output, a violet bold O, as being this G nonlinear function apply element wise or apply to this uh, linear sum S. G is going to be now slightly different from before, this log soft argmax. Okay. That's why we're gonna have to use a different term. Instead of the C, we use this D. And the D is just the negative inner product of the two. Okay. Do you remember what we'll see? C was the negative log of the inner product, right? So what happened here is simply, I just moved the logarithm back into the O, right? So you have the O is simply the logarithm of the Y tilde. And 
you, you have that the two things are exactly the same, right? DYO is the same as the CYY tilde. Okay. Uh, question shouldn't be WXH plus BX plus instead of blah, blah, blah. So the way I, I see this uh, here, right? So this is going to be the matrix that gives me the hidden layer. So this is the matrix for the hidden layer. And this is going to be the bias for the hidden layer. Okay. That, that's why I, I put an H here. Is this a question, Krishna? About S. Yeah, about S, I have S is going to be the affine transformation of the hidden layer. So I have my uh, W for the Y, like the size of the Y, plus the BY, right? BY is going to be something in a five dimension, and WY is going to be something like five times whatever dimensions H has, okay? Why there is S in the picture? Yeah, I will tell you in a second, okay? <laughs> hold, hold, hold on, hold your horses. All right, I show you the S where, where it is. There is no S yet. It will come in one second. So what we are interested in, we said, just to start with, is going to be the partial derivative of my loss with respect to, for example, this first weight matrix, okay? So we have the variation of the loss with respect to this parameter, right? What is the loss? The loss tells me the badness of a specific um, configuration of parameters, right? Per for that specific sample with respect to, so the variation of the loss with respect to variations of this parameter. Okay? And this is going to be, I just copy and paste what I've written before. More or less, it's just the chain rule. Okay. We're going to be going through this in a second. What is the question? Why is D? So this is an identity, right? Um, I, I wrote here, D is going to be simply this thing here. I just put the logarithm inside the, I just compute log of Y, right? And then I took the Y outside. So log Y, log Y tilde is just O, okay? I just put together two things and I got this one outside. So I take the log of the vector and then I multiply the log of the vector times the one hot. Okay, those are exactly equivalent. And exactly, yeah, nothing changes. This is gonna be, okay, why, do I, why did I do that? Because in, uh, in the code later on, we are gonna be using this log soft arg max. Why do we use this log soft arg max? We saw that the soft arg max had the, that exponential. You never take an exponential and then the log, one after the other, because you're gonna have approximations, numerical uh, issues, right? And so the log and the x somehow simplify, cancels out, and you don't have exponential, you know, things going to, to, to numerical problems, okay? So that's how things actually work in practice. And that's why later on on the notebook, I show you how it works implementation-wise. In the implementation, we use a log soft argmax. It, when we talk about mathematics, we just prefer to talk about the soft argmax, which I haven't yet explained fully what it is. Okay, does it make sense, my explanation so far? Okay, I'm still missing how... These two things together, right? What happens if you multiply a one hot with a vector, Jack? If you multiply a one hot with a vector, you're gonna get one value, right? Then you apply the, the log, you're gonna get that single value, then you apply a negative sign in the front. Here, what happened here, I compute the log of all of them, and then I simply extract that single value. No, it's not, gen it's not generic. I just show you in this case, I pick one vector. I pick one scalar element either before, and then I compute the log, or I pick the scalar vector afterwards, okay? The scalar value of the vector. I do, I do the indexing before or after, okay? This is just, in this context works. Okay, let's move on. Otherwise we don't go anywhere. So what is this W? W is the collection of all the weights. What comes next? I forgot. <laughs> See? <laughs> uh, okay, 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 okay. So we, we are interested in this uh, equation here that maybe it doesn't have a meaning. To me, it didn't have a meaning, okay? Even when Jan explains, I see the, the equation, I don't understand, right? So today we try to, well, I, I'll try to make you understand what this line means, okay? 
So let's clean up the, the F thing on the left hand side. Let's remove that the whole network there. And also let's remove that D uh, thing. And now we're going to be replacing that box with the partial of the D with respect to O, right? So this, we're going to be computing now the degree of variation of the D with respect to the O, which is going to be exactly since D equal L, it's going to be exactly as this partial of the L with respect to the O, right? Those two things are identical. So first question here to, to, to people at home, how much is the partial of D with respect to O? This is D, D equal this thing here. If you take the derivative with respect to O, what do you get? Okay, correct. And so the first thing we solve, right? So out of this full long equation, we already know what's going to be the first term. So the first term that comes back from the loss function in order to tune the parameters of the model will simply be the target with flipped sign. First concept, okay? This works in, in the case of classification. Okay, let's move on. Second thing, uh, this second item is going to be the Jacobian of this log soft arg max with respect to its input, right? Do we know what it is? We'll, we'll learn about that uh, towards the end of the class. Let's for now just, you know, we know we have to compute this big thing, but let's ignore it for a moment. Moreover, we said that we're gonna, uh, we have split the decoder in two parts. People were asking, why did I do that? Because we're gonna be doing step by step and figuring out what each of these items in this long equation actually mean. And so we have the decoder now. It's split in several parts. The first part is the affine transformation. That's called, I, I call it A. The output of the affine transformation, which is a function, right? It's going to be this S, the linear sum. And then the linear sum goes through the, where does it go? Through the logs of dark max, right? Which is just called G for, so we don't have to bother with this long word. And so we split the decoder into two sub modules with an intermediate uh, value in the middle, such that I can put it down there for bookkeeping. So far, no magic, right? So far, it's all, all, all clear. No one is complaining, so I just keep going. Anyone complaining? No. <laughs> okay, and then I keep going. All right, what next? Let's clean up the screen. Let's make some room. Let's move that up and let's clean the screen. So we said we would like to understand what this long piece of equation mean. We already know that the first item in this series of multiplication is the negative target, right? Negative even uh, transpose target, but we don't care. So first item we know. The second one, it was the Jacobian of the so logs of dark max, which is like, woof, I feel like, uh, what's, what, uh, sh what's the word? Uh, when you are sh shivers, sh shivers, thank you. I feel chills, I feel chills down the, 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 the back. It's weird, we don't want to care about. So let's pretend we don't care for the moment. Okay. So we start with the forward pass. The forward pass connects the input on the left-hand side that goes through this G nonlinear function until I get a output, okay? These are written in a monospace font because this is like computationally how, how these things work. On the other side, next to the O, what do I have in the diagram? I have the partial of the loss with respect to this O, which has the same number of elements. Whenever also we work with computers, usually they also have the same shape. We don't take transpositions in coding. In mathematics, yes, the Jacobian, the thing are transposed, the gradients are different things. In coding, they are the same size, right? We don't get to transpose anything. So we start with this partial of the loss with respect to the output. And we call that the grad output. This grad output and this partial of the output with respect to the input, right? So this is the variation of the output 
over the variation of the input, which is the same as the Jacobian of this G function. Okay, so this dg over ds is the same as writing the O over the S, where O is the output value of the G function and G is the actual function itself, right? So these two items are the same thing, but there are two different ways of writing the same thing. Um, over here, this means is the Jacobian of a specific function. Over here is just this output over input sort of notation. The cute thing is that if you multiply these two items here, you can see that the DO, DO cancels out. You basically end up with this DL over DS. Okay. That's the cute part of using this different notation. And this is called the grad input, right? So in order to get the grad input, you take the grad output, you multiply it by the partial of the, the Jacobian on the specific module, and then we're going to get this grad input. Okay. This grad input here, it's basically the multiplication of these two terms together. Okay. And so we completely ignore the fact that we don't know how to do this for the moment, but we just mm -hmm. got to compute the multiplication of these two items together. And now we are almost one step away from computing the thing we care. Anyway, let me put a box such that uh, we know that everything is actually, let's say, inside this module, right? Yeah, supposedly. And then I also going to be writing these two items on the left hand side just for bookkeeping, such that we don't forget what we have computed so far. Okay, so let's clean up the screen. And now I replace this multiplication of two items simply with the partial of the loss with respect to the linear sum. So I just replace the two. Okay, so we start anew. If we would like to perform this additional multiplication, what is this? So in this case, as you can tell, we are checking this A, the affine transformation. Once again, we start from an input, which in this case is the green guy, right? Which goes through the affine transformation, which uses some weights, in this case, w, y, that we are interested in, and it produces an output. That was the forward pass. Next to the output, what do we have? How do we call this item over here? How is called this partial of the L with respect to the S? We call it, we said, I type, type, type. No one types anything. <laughs> How do we call it? Grad output. Yes. So we start on the other side with a grad output, right? Then how, what is this going to be interacting with? Well, we're going to be interacting with this DS over the W. Why? Okay. Why is that? Such that these two S's cancel out. And then in the multiplication, I just get this partial of the loss with respect to the parameter, which is exactly the grad weight is called, and this is exactly what we were looking for. Okay, we, we are done. So now we basically know how to compute numerically, like procedurally, right? We, we will do this actually in the notebook uh, in a few minutes. We will know exactly how to compute numerically these items, right? Because everything is quite straightforward, I believe, by watching these diagrams. Tell me if it's not straightforward, then I just go and I am going to cry in the... <laughs> for the next hour because I spend a lot of time. But I hope I hope everything is kind of very clear so far. Let me also draw one more box. Okay. And also let me put there for bookkeeping these two items. Okay. How about the locks of dark max part? That's gonna be way later in the day. Okay. Totally good point. I, I just put it under the carpet for the moment. Good point. Other questions? I hope everything is otherwise clear. I know I just didn't tell you yet how to compute that. I, I believe we are good, right? Because no one is complaining. Quite clear. Very good. Okay. Happy. Alf is happy. Okay. Moving on. What next? Question. What happened with the bias here? What is this module here we are talking about? I need to type a fine transformation. Okay. How do we compute the affine transformation? So people said W H plus B and I asked what is missing bias is missing. 
where should it be missing? So what is the diagram missing right now? Like in, in drawings, right? What shapes are missing in this diagram? An additional input to A, which shape should be? What is the shape that is missing? A circle. Okay, perfect, right? So we miss a circle, which is going to be the con containing this uh, additional parameter, right? Which is going to be feeding the A. Okay. Question. Second question. What is now instead? So that, that's a missing part of the diagram, which is would make this diagram correct. Second question. So it, this diagram is lacking uh, information. Second question. How about grad bias? And I'm, I'm reading the chat, right? If you're not typing anything, I cannot read anything. <laughs> that seems like a reasonable thing to ask about. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, of course, bias, uh, bias are learnable, right? DSDB, DLDS. Uh, yeah, what is DSDB? Uh, Sukrit. Okay, one. So some, can someone tell me what is the grad bias? Zushian is correct. Yeah, it is going to be, uh, how do we call it that? Uh, well, in English here? Well, in, math, in <laughs> coding terms. Uh, grad output, that's correct, yeah. So that's very good, right? The grad bias, we just concluded, right? It's equal to the grad output. Therefore, when you're debugging your network and you want to check the health of your training, I will go check what is the grad bias. Why is that? Type, type, type. You, you got it, right? You, got, you understand the question, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's the same as the grad output, yes. But then why, what? Why do I care about the grad output? What is the grad output uh, necessary for? <laughs> Training, okay. Find a proper bias. No, I don't care about the bias right now. Um, so what is the title of this section of the, of the slide? Backpropagation. Backpropagation of what? What is the subject? Okay, sure. Gradient. Fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Almost. Ah. <laughs> Almost. You, you specific names, right? We, we have some names on the slide here in English, right? Backpropagation of the... What is backpropagated? Grad output. There you go. Okay, good. So the overall backpropagation, it tells you how to backpropagate up to uh, earlier layer, the grad output, okay? And so when I want to debug my training, uh, networks training, I will check the bias grad value item in order to figure out what is the signal that is coming back from the loss throughout the network without need of creating hooks and other weird tricks in PyTorch, right? So without needing to add any additional, you know, grab checking crazy code in your network, every network you already have can be probed even right now to check what is the output gradient by checking the bias gradient. Okay. This is very important, right? Because if you need to debug a training, now you know, I mean, you should have known, but doesn't, now you know that you can simply check the grad, uh, grad bias in order to figure out what is the signal that coming, is coming up the network, okay? Well, coming down because network goes up, right? Are we all good? You understand, right? This is a very powerful, uh, powerful thing. Yes? No? Good? Like, important, right? This is... Uh, because the bias doesn't have interesting gradient, is it? No, 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 no. Uh, yes, I can explain it again. So the, the point here, 
we, we, the first part, when I say bias, is saying that this module here should have another circle with the bias going, going inside, right? That was the first point. The second part here, grad bias, we said that the grad bias is going to be exactly as the grad output because this item over here, ds over the bias is equal one. And so if you multiply this by one, you simply get the grad output, right? So the grad bias is the grad output. Since when I want to monitor the training health, the health of the training of my model, I would like to check what is the grad output throughout my model. In order to do that, I can simply check the grad bias of all my linear layers in order to figure out what is the signal that is going to be updating while changing and generating my grad weight, right? So the grad weight, basically, you can think it think as being computed using the grad bias multiplied by the current this thing over here, okay? We, which we haven't explained what it is. But the point is that the grad weight is function, well, it depends on the grad bias. So checking the grad bias will tell you one step ahead if something got uh, corrupted before that level, right? So that's why it's really important. Well, it's a trick you can use for uh, debugging your, your, your model, okay? Uh, usually people don't know about this. What is a bad grad output? A zero grad output is a bad grad output because there is no learning going to, to happen. Or there is a none grad output or there is plus infinity grad output, right? The point is that you want to check as early as you get a none because after you get a none, all everything is going to be none, 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 so just to clarify the reason why we care about the grad output because we want to propagate not because we want because we do propagate back propagation is the back propagation of the grad output yeah back propagation if you want to make the full sentence is back propagation of the grad output okay moving on what next now we want to care about the partial with respect to the wh right so what happened here you can see i want to okay despite the things disappearing there uh, I would like to compute this partial with respect to dh. Wdh is going to be down here, so I'd need to compute this intermediate value. How to do that? Well, I clean up the center. I get here this the output over the input, right? Which is the Jacobian, which is this thing here, the Jacobian of my affine transformation. And then I multiply these two, and I'm going to get the L over the H because the two S is simplified, right? And so you can basically get the multiplication of these two. It's going to be the partial of the loss with respect to the hidden. And then I can just write them down, right? And then you just keep repeating this all throughout the model. And that was my uh, explanation of uh, uh, backpropagation. Later on, we are going to be checking the correctness of these things in the notebook, but still someone complained about the fact that we haven't talked about the logs of dark max. And before that, someone was complaining that what on earth is this soft dark max? Okay. And so answering this question, we let's, let's figure out what um, this actual soft max and soft main and broken nomenclature is all about. Okay. So far, we are all good, right? We are all on board. Everyone is awake. No one fell asleep. We are starting a new chapter of the lesson. Are you ready? Are you okay? Do you want to take a sip of water? <laughs> okay, just five minutes break. No, no, there is no break. We don't finish otherwise on time. There is plenty of material. Okay. Let, 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 oh, see, we speak in Italian. Okay. Okay. Let, let, let's go on. Right. We, we took a 30 seconds break with my Batman, uh, jingle interpretation. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> actual soft max and soft max. What, 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 what is this stuff? Right. So, Let's assume I have a vector red bold E of capital N elements, E1, E2, ba, 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 bam, EN, okay? It's a column vector. Now I have this 
the following notation. Something soft in square brackets, the square bracket means it's optional. So you may be soft, may not be soft, and m star star means either max or min, right? So here you have four options. You have max, min, soft max, and soft min. Okay, so four different options. Soft is optional, star star means either max or in. Right? Beta also optional. Now forget about the fact that I, I wrote the call next right now. So let's think about the max. I give you a n capital N item. If, if I ask you what is the max of n distinct things, what you're going to tell me? Just one value, right? The max of a vector, right? Of a, of a list or whatever, is going to be one value. So if you take the max or the mean or the soft max or the soft mean, given a vector, you should give me one single value, right? That, that seems to make sense to me, right? I know other people say something else. I don't care. Let's go with this making sensical definition. We define now the softmax uh, with temperature beta as being one over beta log of the summation of the exponential of each component of this uh, vector multiplied by beta. Okay. So you take all the components of the vector, you multiply them by beta, take the exponential, you sum them all, take the log, divide by beta. You're going to get this single value, right? You sum a bunch of scalars, and we call this value softmax. The interesting thing is that if you crank up the coldness, you make it super cold, the softmax, which is like a soft ice cream, what happens to a soft ice cream if you put it in the freezer? It hardens, yes, correct. So the soft max hardens to a max. That, that's why it's called soft max, right? The soft max is like fluffy, like it's like warm, right? If you if you increase the coldness, <laughs> hardens to a max. And the max of a vector is just one value. So seemingly the soft max of a vector should be also one value. On the other case, we have the soft mean, which is defined as the negative one over beta log of the sum of the exponential of the negative components, exponentiated components of the vector, which were multiplied by beta. This one, similarly, if you crank up the coldness coefficient, you make it super cold, the soft mean hardens to a minimum. It's interesting to know, to, to, to notice that the uh, soft minimum can be expressed as negative soft maximum of the negative value, right? That, that seems pretty logical. If I ask you, if you only have the max and I ask you if uh, you have a function, right? You have a bunch of values. Oh, what is the minimum of that vector? Well, you take the, the, the function, you flip it, right? Uh, you take the Sorry, we said, yeah, we want to find the, the minimum, right? That over here. So I flip the function, I take the max, and then I flip it back again, you get the mean, right? So of course, the soft mean can be expressed in terms of soft max. I have this alternative version where I use angular brackets around the vector, and I put a average instead of a sum, right? So these are the average version of the soft max and soft mean. You see, the only difference is going to be the, the angular brackets and the one over n. The interesting thing is that if I make it super hot, where does this ice cream melt? Well, the average soft mean and soft max, both of them will melt to the mean or average. Let's call it average because mean and mean like mean and mean are the same sound I mean, for three chords. So the soft minimum and soft maximum, if you increase the temperature a lot, they melt to the average. Let me see the questions. Why soft max function is different from we learn in class? Now, this is the soft max you learn in class. Everything other, every other soft max you saw before, it's wrong. Uh, yes, we're going to go soft arc max next slide. I think this is weak with me. If you talk about softmax or softmin, these are my softmax, softmin. I know outside the community is doing wrong things. I don't care what other people are doing wrong. In class, for educational purpose, we do things right. 
if you know what is right, then you can tell right from wrong. If you never taught what's right and what's wrong, then you don't know what's right and what's wrong, right? So in class, we stay with right definitions. Then of course, when you read a paper, you will know that people are just wrong. I will explain this with the next slide and make sure you're, you're, you're understanding this. Okay. <laughs> Again, the maximum of a set of numbers is just one number. So soft maximum is also one number. It cannot be something else. Anyway, moving on. Uh, so this is how both these uh, functions look. Okay. So I have this vector over here. It has uh, five item, items. They could be like my uh, linear sum, the output of the, of the thing. So the maximum value is going to be something like 1.54, which is shown to you by this dot line. And then I have this dotted line here which is showing you the minimum value of this vector, which is negative 218. What type of diagram is this? How do you describe this diagram by paying attention to the axis? What is it? Everyone is answering the wrong answer. So just pay attention more to the diagram and then answer the correct thing. So I will say that the horizontal axis is logarithmic. This is a very funky type of diagram. This is called semi-log. Okay. So it is logarithmic from one to 1000. From one to negative one, it's linear. From negative one to negative 1000 is again logarithmic. Okay. You cannot have negative numbers in logarithms. Okay. So this is different and important. If you change the scale, you're going to see that nothing works very well to explain things. Anyway, this is going to be linear from here to here, logarithmic upwards, logarithmic downwards, right? You never have negative numbers. You could have 10 to the minus one, 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus three. I don't have those, right? So everything here is just squashed down to a linear because otherwise I wouldn't be able to show you negative values with a logarithmic scale. That's why it needs to be linear in order to be able to cross the zero. Okay. But if it's not logarithmic afterwards, then I cannot show you this asymptotic trend. So in this case, I show you asymptotic trend for positive value. I show you the full range of variations in a linear range. And then I show you asymptotic value, asymptotic values for well, asymptotic trend for negative values. Okay. Anyway, you have to think about this later on a bit more. Anyway, what we have here is that this is the maximum value. The softmax is always under uh, lower bound by this max, right? And as you can see on the horizontal axis, I have the coldness. You increase the coldness, you get frozen, right? As you can tell here, you decrease the coldness, you get hot and hot and warmer until you sweat. Okay. So we said that both these uh, average soft max and these actual soft max, both of them hardens to the maximum as I increase the coldness, right? Similarly, the soft minimum and this kind of average soft minimum converges to the actual minimum, right? When I freeze it and make it super cold. On the other case, when I make it super warm, the average softmax and the average soft mean, both of them will converge to the average, which is this dotted value here, which is point negative uh, three. Okay. Again, I will give you the slides. You can pay more attention. You can pay more, uh, you know, think about more about these things. You can plot it yourself, try to figure out how it works. This is how these two things work. Both softmax and soft mean are going to be approximation. Uh, of the max and the mean respectively, if you make it super cold, otherwise they uh, either are uh, going up and down or they converge to the average. Are there any conventional choice of coldness? Uh, it's a hyperparameter. You can, you can decide to tune it. Okay. For different reasons. I'll tell you more about that future lessons. 
Okay, so then we talk about, we haven't talked about the soft arc max and soft arc min. Finally, yeah, too many people drop the arg and they call the soft max and soft min. They cannot possibly be because it would be uh, still in the name of the other thing. So let's check this thing. I have a vector E still N items. Here I have this possibly soft in, in square bracket. That means it's optional arg, ax, and mean. Okay, again possibly uh, with a coldness coefficient. This thing goes from R n, which is my n-dimensional vector, to the simplex. So what is the simplex? Simplex is going to be just this shape that is going to be um, connecting the uh, one zero 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 one zero and zero zero one. Okay. Every point on this simplex is going to be a probability. All this, the summation of all the coordinates on every point in this plane here, in this item here, they will sum to one, okay? It's also called probability simplex. All right, so we define this soft dark max as being the exponential of the vector, all element, right? Divided by the summation of all this, the components, right? So this is the exponentiation of each component, well, the, all the components, and then you divide by the sum, the sum. The interesting thing is that if you increase the coldness, you make it super cold, this thing converges to an argmax, okay? What is an argmax? It's a vector, it's a one hot vector, where the one is happening in correspondence to the max of the, of the, of the, of the vector, okay? So if you take a vector, you check what is the arg max. The arg max is going to be a one hot vector where the one is like an indicator showing you where it is. The interesting thing is that let's say let's say you have a vector now and two value the two value, the maximum is shared by two values. Okay, what is going to be doing the arg max? If you do arg max of a vector with two maximum values, what is going to be telling you? Maybe the earlier index, right? What is going to be a uh, soft arc max doing instead? It's going to give one half, one half, exactly, right? So it's going to be splitting the mass across the equally, uh, equally equal values, right? Awesome. So it's a better kind of uh, arc max, right? Similarly, we can define the soft arc mean, right? which is going to be equal to the soft arc max where I flip the sign of the vector. Just one inside. There is no flipping of the, of the, of the sign outside as before. Okay. Guess, guess, uh, guess what? If you increase the temperature, right, of the soft argument, you're going to get the argument. Right? Uh, the output of the soft arc max is still in the same dimension space as the input, right? Well, kind of, yes. So this, this thing is the, uh, it's written here, right? This thing here is in the box zero one n dimension, right? Input n, output n, box zero one box, right? But then this plane is cutting the box, right? The, that's the, this is a notation. So it's still a box of n, n dimensional. This is a notation of this chopped version because you chop one, slice less, right? So if, if you have a cube, right? Uh, let's say you have a cube, you chop the, 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 the cube in one slice, right? You have a plane. So but the simplex will always have like one less uh, dimension than the dimension in which the simplex lives. Okay, notation. Just forget about the, it's just notation, okay? We don't care. Um, one more thing is that if you increase drastically the temperature and it's super hot, both the soft arc max and soft arc mean will converge to the one over n uniform vector, which is like a uniform probability distribution across all of the uh, items. Okay. I hope now I somehow convince you, which is a better way of calling these things. Okay. Let me show you how it works, right? Uh, something interesting is also the fact that the soft arg max is the derivative of the soft max, which is also the derivative of the average soft max. Can you tell me why these two things are the same? 
maybe you didn't catch it, but maybe it's not important. What is the difference between the average soft max and the other soft max? You remember? Yeah, yeah. The one over n. Where was the one over n? Inside the log, and therefore you can split the product as in a two two logarithm, the, the, the two the summation of the two logarithms, and you take the derivative. That thing disappears. That you're very good. Yes. Okay. One more thing. You also have that the just in case you didn't know, but now you know. The arg max is also the derivative of the max. Okay. So if the max gives you one item, this thing here is going to be the one hot indicator where the max came from. Let's, let's have a look about how this looks. So this is the same vector I showed you before. And this is going to be the soft arc max, right? If it's super cold, it's super blue, dark blue, right? It's super, super, super cold. We said this is, um, hardening to a arg max. And in fact, we can tell we have the one hot, right? And zero, 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 zero. If you go on the other extreme, you have super, 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 super hot by shown to you by this uh, sweaty uh, emoji. You have that the red thing is going to be one over five, right? One fifth. Why one fifth? Because there are five equally uh, five items, right? So you have one fifth, one fifth, one fifth, one fifth. On average, like if you go in the middle, then you have something nice, right? You have some non one hot nor average, something in the middle. Okay, very good. So far, so then we have the next chapter and then we have the notebook, okay? So this is going to be one more step building up all the, all the tension. We, I'm gonna give you now even something more and I, and I really hope you can digest it. Well, understand what I'm trying to tell you because everything at the end will just it will like uh, telescope in, right? They will, they will, how do you call it? Like they will like, like if you have a domino, right? Now I put all the pieces of the domino ta, 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 and at the end I will just do tick and then you see and they will all uh, solve themselves at the end, right? It's like when you have like a suspended chord, right? In music and you have that kind of feeling of tension and then you have the dominant final uh, relaxation of the joining, the reaching the, 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 the fundamental of your chord, right? Okay, okay, okay. All right, moving on. So we saw a few uh, alternatives uh, before we saw the, the classical model X going to the predictor, we get the hidden value, right? Then we go through the decoder, we had the Y tilde that was going to the C. Then we saw the other one, which was going through the predictor. And then we had some sort of weird decoder where we were getting that O, which was already including the logarithm. And now <laughs> one more, right? So we have three distinct perspectives over the same classifier but they will really become very convenient and helpful at the end. With that said, let's move on. Cross entropy. So this is a reminder of what we have seen so far. We start with the pink ball X at the bottom left hand side. This goes through the predictor and then the first affine transformation A. This thing is going to give me my S, right? The linear sum. Then how were we getting the uh, Y tilde? Where do I have to send S to? I have to send S to S, S, G in the soft arc max. Perfect. So I, I, I send S through the soft arc max and I'm going to get this Y tilde, which is some sort of approximation of my Y, right? And the Y is like a arc max now. We understand it's this one hot thing. So we had this one hot there. And then we will add what a cost term C in order to get the prediction close to the target. We said that the C was going to be the negative log of the inner product. And then we have this big box F, which is our energy and the energy, which express the level of incompatibility of the given input pair is going to be equal to the cost that I pay for making a prediction that is far from my target. We know everything. Finally, we choose our loss functional because it's acting on the function. So it's a function of a function. Therefore, it's called a functional. Anyway, my loss functional 
Remember, we chose it to be equal to type, 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 type. <laughs> ah, yes, the energy, energy. That that's correct. That that's correct. Right. So we we made this choice before. On the right hand side, instead, we're going to be having this alternative perspective, this negative linear output perspective. What is it about? So I have my pink ball X at the bottom. I send this to my predictor and the affine transformation. So I get exactly the same uh, linear sum. And then I put the sum inside a box with a capital D. Hmm. This capital D is going to be my negative linear output, which is going to be the negative inner product between blue ball y and the vector s, the linear sum, okay? Just, just, just because. It's gonna be helpful in a bit. All right, moving on. Let, let's take this for granted. When we have a big box f, what is going to be f? f is the level of blah, blah, blah. What is it? f is the incompatibility of my inputs. And then we set this to be equal. What is going to be equal? Why is D? Because D is the only term inside the dash box. Okay. So inside the dash box, there is only one red term. So F is going to be the level compatibility of the input is going to be equal to this D, whatever divergence, blah. What is going to be the loss? Well, we don't know. That, that's why it's going to be interesting. Okay, we, we try to work out this thing together. So let, let, let's rewind what we have so far. We start with the fact that the F is going to be this D, Y and S. Okay, okay. And then we have the D, D, the specific value of my pair, right? It's going to be this negative Y S multiplied, right? So I extract what, what does this mean, right? So this means I extract the specific value of the S, right? And then I can also write something uh, interesting here. This is going to be my full function, right? So this is the full cost function, function of all possible values of Y. And this is simply going to be the full vector of negative linear output, okay? I hope you can tell. This one is going to be selecting one specific value out of this vector, like we were doing before with that D. Here instead, I just pick the whole set of values, right? The full negative uh, linear output. Okay. Now, remember how we were computing the loss before. The loss, remember, was equal to in the previous, uh, in the previous view, right? Loss was C and C was the negative negative Y times Y tilde, right? How to compute Y tilde? Log soft are uh, soft uh, everything wrong. Soft. Oh my God. Soft arc max. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Thanks. So Y tilde was soft arg max of the linear output, right? Now I have a negative sign. So if I have a negative sign, what should I use instead? If I compute the soft arg max of the S, but now I have this negative thing, I will have to use the soft arg mean. Okay, very good, very good, very good, very good, very good. Right, so I just type now all we said in the chat and I, I said in the, in the air here. I will have that my loss functional, because it's a function of a function, is going to be this, okay, let's put it negative, one over beta, let's forget about that. Log of the y multiplied by the soft arg mean of this f, right? And this soft arg mean of f is exactly soft arg max of the s, right? Uh, if you just replace uh, inside, you, you automatically get the thing, okay? Where the soft arg mean is the exponential of the negative thing divided by the sum of the exponential, right? We, we know about that. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, how about we compute this logarithm, right? We compute the logarithm of an exponential. What do we get? 
this thing jumps out, right? But then this negative beta simplify with this thing, right? And so what do we get now? If I compute the negative of one over beta, exactly, you get, I get F, right? So I get F and then what do I get? There's a division, right? I have a log of a division, so I'm gonna get the, I will have a negative sign, a subtraction, but there is a, a negative in front, so I will get a addition, very good. And so I'm gonna get this one, right? My loss is going to be the energy at the correct XY pair plus one over beta log, sum of the exponential of the negative terms. So let's just write this one in the previous slide, okay? So here, the loss on the left-hand side was the energy. On the right-hand side, instead, what should I be writing here? So the loss is going to be the energy at the correct side plus that summation of things, okay? So I have this F, which came out, plus this thing over here. So now it's very, very interesting, right? How do we train a system by minimization of the type? Ah, loss. Forget about beta for now. Uh, beta is equal one for now. For now. Uh, okay, minimization of the loss, right? If I minimize this thing, right? I want to minimize this one. I will try to minimize this, right? But since there is a minus here, I will try to push up here. So I pull, I push down, sorry, I push down here, but I pull up on these terms. This is so interesting. Why Tiller runs for all categories. See, why, why, sorry, why prime? It's all possible categories. All right, so this is just first time you see something that I would tell you in advance is called a contrastive loss because you push down on the correct guy, but then you pull up everywhere, right? You pull up for every other possible thing. We don't know yet how it works, but we just smell something funny. All right, let's go back here. And I tried to, yeah, we had to go to the notebook as well. So what is this right hand side thing here? What is it? Can you tell me what it's called? Uh, what, uh, and almost, almost, ah, there you go. Kagler is correct. That's the, that is the negative soft mean, okay? Because you have negative one over beta log sum of exponential of negative beta, okay? So if I, if I just clean up the screen, I, I, I start here. We have that the loss is equal this scalar value, the correct energy, minus the minimum value that the energy takes. Well, the soft minimum value the energy takes. Okay. So this is a scalar. This is a, let's say, a vector, but then I compute the minimum, right, of a vector. So I have a scalar. If it's just the minimum, this is actually called the, uh, perception loss, but we don't care. Anyway, this is going to be, my loss is going to be the difference, right? I have between my specific correct value and the minimum value the energy takes or the soft minimum value the energy takes. We don't know what it means, but we might understand that later. Now I'm interested to compute the partial derivative of this equation here with respect to the correct case. How much is it? Can you tell me? One over here, okay. What is this thing here? Soft mean, right? That was the negative beta. Uh, yeah, you're correct. One min minus soft arg mean, okay? That, that you're correct. So you're going to have the exponential divided by the sum of exponential, right? Where you have the one over because you have log, right? So you have the log, so everything goes underneath and then you multiply by the correct guy. So you have the correct guy divided by all of them, right? And so as you, as you told before, and this is going to be in the uh, soft argument, right? So I, I just use this symbol over here 
to represent the probability that the model assigns to the correct class given the specific input x parameterized by the weights w, okay? And also by having this temperature uh, coldness the coefficient here. Okay, final, final uh, question. How much was this? The soft arg mean of the, of the linear output? Well, soft arg max of the linear output or the soft arg mean of the negative linear output. How do we call it this? At the beginning of the, the lesson, like two hours, one hour and a half ago. Remember when we do the forward pass on the model, right? This thing here is the soft arg mean of the negative linear output or is the soft arg max of the linear output? Soft arg max of the linear output, remember? G is the, the function, right? I actually call G two, two distinct things. I should change that, right? No, O was the log, uh, log soft arg max, right? What was the soft arg max? Why? Uh, 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 okay, almost. We don't have y hat. We don't have y hat. What do we have here in this class? It's called y. Fix that notation. Y tilde. Yeah, you got it right. There we go. So this is going to be one minus blue ball y times y tilde. You see, in a second, your brain is going to be like. Not yet. Don't, 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 don't go crazy yet. Let's define y hat. Now you see y hat is the contrastive sample. That means all the y's minus the correct case. Okay. This is all y's minus the correct condition. All right. So what it is this, what is the gradient of this expression with respect to the incorrect class? We can do it. So we can actually, I can show you. Oh, okay. Y hat transpose Y tilde. That's correct. Kagler. Yes. And also Y hat T Y tilde Martin is also correct. Joe Young is not correct because the first term is going to be a constant with respect to the incorrect class. Okay. And this is the correct class because it's blue. Okay. The blue is going to be the correct guy. The red is going to be the hot guy the, with the hat. I haven't told you about the colors yet. Uh, the colors will come in a bit. Anyway, let's move forward. You have zero minus this thing over here. And the, this thing over here is simply the extraction, basically, of the probability in, in the... So this is going to be one hot, right? This is my one hot extracting the incorrect probability we care about, right? So I have one of these guys. Okay, how many items do I have? How many correct classes do I have for a point? In this classification, one, okay. How many incorrect classes do I have in this five, five um, classification way thing? Four, okay. So how do you call a vector that is one for the correct class and zero for the other classes. How do you call a vector? Yeah, okay, one hot. Okay, 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 okay. But how do you call exactly, argmax is also correct. How do we call the correct uh, specific one in this case? What symbol should I be using to represent the correct uh, one? Y, right? The blue ball Y. And so, if I just put together these two things and I ask for the gradient with respect to the full energy, this is going to be the difference between the target and the prediction, which is the same gradient you get when you perform the differentiation of the MSC. Right? You see? Yes, I can repeat. Okay. So when you have the MSC, one half square uh, norm, right? Of Y minus Y tilde, right? You take the derivative of that thing with respect to the Y tilde. 
you're going to get what? The, just the difference, right, between the target and the, and the prediction. Now I show you in a classification case that the grad output with respect to the negative linear output okay, is going to be exactly the difference between my target and the prediction, the Y tilde I make, which is exactly as MSC, as uh, regression. So I'm showing you right now that the grad output, the signal that we use to train the model for classification is the same signal we use for regression. Ah. <laughs> okay, all right. Let me speed up through because now that we have, so the, this one, I don't know if you notice, uh, what is the loss here? How do we call the loss? If you just say one word, if you, if you skip a bit of symbols, how can we call this loss by skipping a few symbols? Just put together the English and skipping the mathematics. <laughs> this is the same as we were, I show you like uh, two hours, one hour and a half ago, right? This is the logs of dark max, the G function I show you before, which I put it under the carpet and someone asked me, oh, how do I compute the derivative of the soft logs of dark max? I just show you. Well, it was the logs of dark max of S which is the same as the dot soft dark mean of minus s, right? Because you just flip the, uh, the sign inside, you flip the, 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 the thing, right? You, you see who asked the question? I don't know who asked the question, I forgot, but this is the answer to your question. I hope you're happy, I am. Anyway, moving forward, otherwise we don't finish. Can you explain how you put the two derivatives together into the last statement? Yeah, no, I think I already explained that. All uh, right, so I said we have only, uh, just go quickly, we have one correct blue guy, right? And so this is one for the correct case, which is the blue guy. And here you're going to have as many zeros, right? As these red guys. How many red guys you have? The full set of possible cat classes, categories, right? Minus the correct one, right? So I have one correct and capital K minus one incorrect. And so this is going to be one hot, right? One and all the others are zero, 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 zero. Which one is the one? Well, this one, zero, 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 whatever is the correct thing is just the one, the blue guy, right? The blue ball guy is the one hot, which has the index in correspondence of the uh, correct class, right? And so if I put together the partial derivative with respect to the function, so this is a bit funky, right? It's a, gradient with respect to a function, but it's okay because it's a discrete function, which is a vector. So I'm like, ah, it's okay. Don't, don't worry. So this is just a partial derivative with respect to the negative linear sum. Yeah. And it's just equal to the y minus y tilde, right? Because I don't have to select anymore. I just put the one hot here in front and I subtract the whole thing. If it's not yet clear, I'll tell you more about once we are done with the class. Okay, I hope you, ah, good, good, okay. All right, so now physical intuition, then wait, sorry, I don't understand the symbol. This is a subtraction in set theory. This capital uh, curly Y is the set, this, this, this is, okay, very good. All right, so we have this one, right? The partial, uh, the gradient, Okay, same shit, right? The gradient with respect to the free energy with the energy is going to be the distance to the target. Okay, that's very easy to say, right? All right, so when I just initialize the network, what do I get as an output? But I already told you the solution. You get basically all zeros. Why is that the case? Quick, quick, quick. Why an initialized network gives me all zeros? How do we initialize these models? We don't de de initialize with zeros. We initialize them with near zero random weights. Correct. You kind of everyone put together the answer. The point is that the largest singular value is going to be very tiny, right? So basically, if you stack a few layers, 
it will collapse the output to zero. So when you train the network, the weights are small, output is zero, more or less. So let's draw this. My energy at the output of the model, the negative linear output is going to be all zeros. What is going to be the Y tilde, the, the, the soft argument, right? What is going to be soft argument of FF? Quick, 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 quick. <laughs> ah, come on, answer. <laughs> yeah. uh, average, yes, the, the uniform distribution. Perfect, right? So Y tilde is going to be the uniform distribution, but then you have the one minus, one hot minus, right? And so you got get this one. So if you check for the negative gradient, all these guys are going to be pointing up, right? Pulling up every energy level by one over capital K, where capital K is number of classes, and the correct class boom, gets pointed, pulled down by a vector of height one. You see? I just draw the one hot, well, the, the, the y tilde minus one hot, because I show you the negative gradient, right? We follow the negative gradient to update the uh, parameters and this, so on, right? Yes? Are we good? So I step with this gradient, what happens? Well, the blue guy will get pulled down, right? And so you get that step by step, you push down the energy of the correct class while pulling up the energy of everything. Good? Good, okay, moving on. Now, what happens if I crank up the AC? It's super, 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 super cold. Uh, the convergence to the Y tilde converge to the, yeah, the minimum of the energy, right? the maximum of the thing, but we like to think in energy and therefore minimum, right? So the Y tilde was the, okay. So, so uh, soft arg minimum, right? Ar ar arg minimum. So we, the Y tilde converges to the arg minimum and the blue ball Y is the correct class. And so, so if we crank up the coldness, right? The blue guy will get the the, the arrow pointing down, right? So it's going to be pushing down the, uh, the correct case. But then what's happening? Which one is going to be the... What's happening? Tell me. <laughs> which one, the other guy? Which, which one, which one, which one, which one? Yeah, tell me which one. Ah, red one. Nah, 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 nah. Which red guy, right? I have a super cold uh, environment, right? So you only pick one. Which one do you pick? The lowest red one. Yes, Martin. The fourth one. Correct. Calcular. And so here you're going to get an arrow down for the blue guy and an arrow up for the fourth item, such that after stepping in this direction, right, the negative gradient, you're going to get that the blue now is going to be lower and the one that was the lowest will get a bit less lower. This is also called the, as I said before, the perceptron loss functional. Yeah. Just for sake of not knowing things. Finally, what happens in the generic case, right? This is a generic case. I have a arbitrary distribution of energy values. I will have an arbitrary pulling up forces, right? Why do I call them forces? Because I take the gradient of an energy, right? So remember from physics 101, the gradient of the energy, the, the energy is the force, right? Anyway, so I pull up all, I pull up, yes, everyone proportionally to the probability the model associates to these uh, values, right? And I push down with strength of one, the correct case, such that when I follow this, I will have a lower value for the blue guy, right? 
I keep pushing down and I keep pulling up. When does this stuff stops? Even maybe this one is going to be easier to think about it, right? Let's even think in the regime of super cold temperatures. When is this process stopping? Yeah, 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 I'm asking which one is the convergence? When the blue is the lowest. That's correct, Zoshian. Whenever you pull down the lowest class, right? The lowest, and you push, you push down and pull up the same lowest one with the same, the correct one, like whenever the correct one is going to be the lowest energy one, right? And it's actually when quite down. So it's like, or even in this super coldness coefficient, so cold and, uh, coldness regime. So we don't even have to care about other issues. You're going to get whenever the correct answer is the lowest one, then you will stay at the equilibrium because you have two uh, equi equi equal. Yeah, it's, equi it's a correct word. You have equal strength. Uh, vectors put in two opposite direction, which does no longer move your energy levels. Right? Unfortunately, the case with this maximum likelihood is that if you don't have a super cold environment, what's the issue here? Tell me. You, you let me know, okay, in the future. Think about it, right? Uh, yeah, you never stop pu pushing down, right? You, you're always pushing because you will always. Uh, use every contribution. Anyway, we are doing very well because now, as I, will t I was telling you, everything will just uh, like the domino simplify in the notebook. So we are going to be putting our nose inside this uh, code and figure out all the things we have just computed now uh, with the math and the slides and the things with numerical values such that we get some sort of relief from this very intense, I think at least it was for me, set of uh, equations. Okay, are we good? Are we moving forward? Are we okay? Are you happy? Yep, yeah, happy, okay. But when the system is not that cold, wouldn't it be, so? yeah, yeah, exactly. That was the issue there. So we go, CD work, GitHub book, Git status, what the fuck? Ah, git cd uh, python, git git status, okay, git pull, okay, conda activate book, Jupyter lab. All right. All right, so let, let's import the torch and the NN, right? This notebook is not yet available. Maybe it's going to be available, maybe not. It's like five lines of code, so maybe it's not even important. I import torch and torch uh, NN, right? So from the libraries. Here I fix nomenclature such that I call things with the correct name and I don't, I don't get confused. Then I generate my X, which is going to be a random vector of two items is a row with two elements, okay? And this is going to be just two random values. Here, I just generate one hot vector with a random uh, value, right? So I have here my one hot vector, right? Which is the uh, tens with the number three, right? Zero, one, two, three. And these are the same equation we saw before. Hidden H is gonna be the uh, nonlinear function of the affine transformation of the input. S is the output of the affine transformation of the hidden which is this thing here, O is going to be this logs of dark max of the S. And this is why I introduced the logs of dark max before, because this is how it works in, in code. Okay. Uh, F is going to be maybe just the redo. Why not? And then D was the inner product, negative inner product. So here I have my model. Okay. I have the uh, predictor, which is going to be going from two to seven, just a number for small, for, for, for be able to print things. And two is going to be the point in the plane and seven is going to be my hidden representation. Then I have the nonlinearity we go. Then I have my affine transformation A, which is going to be this NN linear. I have the G, which is going to be this log soft arc max. And D is going to be this negative log log neg negative log likelihood loss, which is the negative inner product between the uh, O and Y. So I execute this one. Tell me if there are things that are not clear, okay, in the chat, please. I, I think I, so far everything is clear. 
So here I generate things. I have H is going to be the output of my predictor, which is the first line. Second line, I have the, the linear sum. This S is the output of applying the affine transformation to the hidden value, the hidden layer. Then I compute the O as being the uh, G, the logs of dark max over my linear sum. Here, I tell PyTorch, I would like it to uh, keep the gradients of both the linear output and these uh, logs of dark max output, such that when I compute backprop, I can inspect those gradients. Otherwise, backprop deletes the gradients of values that don't, they are not parameters and they are not, uh, yeah, they are not parameters, right? And they are not leads. So here I show you the value of the S. I show you, well, we are just executed, right? I show you what is the linear, uh, linear sum, right? The linear sum, it, I, whether it, it will keep the, the gradients around, yes. And whether it does have a gradient, no, it does not have a gradient. I have not yet compute uh, any gradient. The O, the logs of dark max output is going to be whatever value. And you can, you can see here who is that generated that thing, right? This is the function that generated this thing. It will keep the gradients around, yes. It does have a gradient right now, no. Now I compute the loss, which is going to be, remember, the F, the energy, because we set, this is the setting uh, equality. And then I have this one equal the D, and the D was the negative inner product. Unfortunately, here I had to use the C, the index, rather than the one hot, because that's how the library defined it. And then I print the loss. The loss is going to be 1.41. First question. Uh, oof, I don't know if I have time. What is 1.41? Can you tell me how to compute this number from any network that has five classes? If you use your calculator right now, okay, take it as an exercise for home. Uh, you should tell me why or whether this is a reasonable number or not. How to tell whether this is a reasonable number or not. How to compute this number for any network that has five classes. You, you have to think about this and let me know. I, I cannot, I need to go forward right now. But if you don't figure it out, let's talk about this tomorrow. Here, I just compute back propagation, which is the whole sequence of the things I show you with the diagrams. Here, I just show you the output gradient and the linear output gradient. Oh, what is this thing? Remember from the slides? If I compute the partial of this D expression with respect to the O, what do I get? Type in the chat because we are running out of time otherwise. Negative Y, right? So this is the first time you can see the num numerical uh, counterpart to the things we just described before. Here. Yeah. The other thing was, what is this thing? What is the gradient with respect to the S, the linear output. Remember, we said it was the one hot, right? The, the Y minus Y tilde. Again, since here I consider the, that, we, that was considering the negative S. Remember F or N was the negative, negative S. So here it's, since we consider the S grad is going to be flipped inside, right? And so this is going to be simply the soft arc max of the linear output, right? minus the one hot. I hope you can understand this, right? The sign is flipped because of the fact that we check the gradient with respect to the linear output and not the negative output. So there is a one difference from the, from the thing we saw. And here you can see it's exactly the same. Okay. So this is what? This is the grad output, right? The gradient with respect to the output of the affine transformation of the hidden layer, right? What did we say before in the slide? Where, how can we check for the grad output if I have a linear layer? 
grab bias. Very good. And so here I just show you the affine transformation grab bias. And if you can see, it's exactly the same, right? You should say, oh, okay, type, we can type, oh, okay. Okay, finally, and then we are done. <coughs> oh no, actually we have some time, right? We have five minutes. Oh, we have plenty of time. I thought I was running late. So this is one thing I struggle a lot with. Uh, every time I see this thing here, right? This vector matrix vector multiplication, I never understand uh, what it really means. Okay, it kind of, I don't know how to compute this partial derivative, it's confusing. So what I usually do is just I expand the meaning, right? W what is this matrix vector multiplication? This matrix vector, matrix vector multiplication, it's simply the linear sum, right? Of the column of this thing here, this table, right? Scaled by the coefficients in this vector over here, right? So that means first column plus multiplied by the first coefficient coefficient plus the second column times the second coefficient plus blah, 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 times the, uh, is it correct? D column, yeah, the D, this column times the this coefficient, right? Because we have D uh, value plus the bias, right? So as you can tell, the bias, well, the, the partial with respect to the with the S, right, is going to be the same as the partial with respect to the bias, right? Because you have all the summation. So each of these terms share the same uh, gradient. So that's why we had the answer before below, right? That you think that they are the same. The other, the other case is going to be what is the gradient with respect to this first vector? What is the gradient with respect to this first column vector? Uh, the, 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 sorry, the partial of the partial DL over partial DW1, okay? You have to multiply the grad output, right, by H1. I believe that's what Jack uh, meant. And so I have to multiply the full vector, right, the, the, the thing that is the, the grad bias, sorry, the, the, well, I had to multiply the grad bias basically by one scalar for the first guy, one scalar for the second guy, one scalar for the last guy, right? I hope you're still with me because this is going to be blowing your mind, maybe. So let's check a bit of sizes, right? Such that we know what we are doing. So this is my grad bias, right? I have that the hidden representation is a row vector of seven elements. I have that the grad output is going to be a row vector of five elements. I have that the weight is going to be a five times seven because it shoots towards five dimension in the output coming from seven from the hidden. And the same size will be shared by the gradient, right? So how do I get a five by seven? from a vector that has seven and one vector that has five. This grad output, right, has to be scaled by each of these coefficients. You can see, right? This grad output or grad bias, right, has to be scaled by these coefficients, right? And so you can just do that by having S grad T. Well, even let's not have S grad T. Oh, okay, this is grad output, right? But we can even type directly this one, which is even more cool, I think, right? So we can actually have the grad bias. Well, you can just write the grad output, right? There we go. And so this is the uh, partial I compute by hand. And then if I check here the, the partial that uh, PyTorch computed are the exact same. So these things are the grad output, right? Or grad bias multiplied by the each component of the H. And so if I, if I check H, do I have H somewhere? No, I never print H. 
let's print h just for sake. You can see h is going to be some value, 0, 0, 0, because this is the output of the real, right? So there were negative values here. And then I have three other values that survive. And so you're going to get that the grad, uh, grad bias gets multiplied by 6, 0.615, uh, 6015, <coughs> 0, 0, 0, 0, 80, 0 0.51, 0 0.22. Okay. And that was the masterpiece of two hours of dense gradients and back propagation and energy and everything. How did it go? You still there? Someone is still there. Most of you are still there. No one is typing anything anymore. <laughs> are you okay? We, we are done with the lesson. Are you excited? Are you happy? It's a lot. I know. I don't know if I could repeat but I feel like I learned something very good. Okay. So everything was, yeah, I, I, okay. Dance still alive. Definitely you, you should go over. I, I, I'm publishing the, the slides right now on the, on the Google doc, right? So go through all the steps we went through, uh, the notebook. I don't know if I publish it, but I guess you can still watch the, the last part. Otherwise the, the, the most convenient thing is actually uh, to, to try to do this yourself, right? Maybe, or maybe you can just copy the, from the screen or I can put it online. Right. Uh, I'll decide. Uh, anyway, so the, the, the whole thing was uh, a new thing, right? I, I, I haven't taught it yet. So it was also a challenge for me. I think we, I deliver everything I wanted to talk about today in a two hours time. Tomorrow we're going to be uh, computing this energy, the, the, the shapes I show you uh, at the beginning of the lesson. And then finally, we'll train a neural network to perform classification, which was the beginning, the, the original goal. But then we kind of went through many, many, many uh, different ways to learn about this energy perspective and the arg, 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 soft arg mean, soft arg max, soft max, soft mean, and all these things. And the grad bias, grad output, grad input, ah, so many things. But I hope you like it. I enjoy it a lot. Have a nice evening. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye bye. Questions? <laughs> I mean, I hope you liked it. I really, I, I really did. I, I really think I, uh, I mean, I loved it. Okay. No questions, right? Enough. I think enough of me for, for today. Just take the time to go through the, 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 the different lines. I recommend to do this before tomorrow session, since tomorrow we just try to finish up uh, this section uh, and training the model. I can address questions if you have questions about today lesson, which would be very nice such that we can conclude the uh, chapter of backpropagation, classification, energy-based model, uh, basics 101 for this part of the class. Otherwise, thank you so much for your attention. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Have a good night. <laughs>